Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the Sky and Telescope series. And I am super happy to have Sky and Telescope authors Guy Consul Manuel with us and Chris Greeny with us today. Hey, brother Guy. Hey, Chris. How are you guys doing? It's great to be here, even though I'm talking to somebody at Arizona State and I'm down in Tucson at the moment, the University oh, of Arizona. <laughs> and, we're brothers, we're brothers, brothers in arms. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm away uh, for, from you all in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we are, past, uh, uh, we are past the equinox. So how is fall happening in Louisville? Have the trees started to go? Or are we getting a little touch of cooler weather? Yeah, I actually chose a place to sit down and do this it's where I was could look out and be surrounded by trees changing beautiful colors, which was lovely, lovely choice for uh, for scenery, but perhaps not so great for uh, Wi-Fi connection. No, oh, well, you're doing great so far, so it's very good. Uh, and I think Brother Guy are both here and in, in, still in the heat of Arizona a little bit, although it's cooling off a little bit. It's cool. A little bit. Yeah, we're getting we're getting a little drier weather anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, let's see, and let's talk about where, where you guys are, uh, what your uh, home base is for um, what you do. So, um, Brother Guy. Well, I've got two places. Uh, one is here in Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. and the other is in Rome, outside of Rome, in a little town called Casta Gandolfo, because I'm the director of the Vatican Observatory. Very cool. And the Vatican has its own national observatory. The Vatican is a nation, and it's got a national observatory. It's been like this for 130 years. Very cool. We've got some fabulous 1930s vintage telescopes out in Rome. Unfortunately, a 1930 vintage sky, which is now full of light pollution. <laughs> so about 30 years ago, we built a telescope uh, in the mountains uh, east of Tucson. Cool. And we now have two locations. And so I have to be a migratory bird going back and forth. Um, I'm good. here for a couple of more weeks in Tucson before I head back to Rome. Okay. So how many times do you make that trip between Rome and, let's say, Tucson? So roughly two or three times a year. Um, it's way too much. I have way too many frequent flyer miles, and I'm trying to cut back. Uh, whenever I can travel in the states, I'll travel by train to you know help Ooh. the carbon emission. But they don't have a train to Europe yet. Ah, uh, not yet. We'll have to put a tube underneath the ocean, and we'll do that little tube thing as we can. So. Yeah, very cool. And Chris, where where are you? Uh, what are you doing, and what's your home base at? My home base is in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I am uh, spending a lot of time, well, working on some stuff that Guy and I will probably talk about here, uh, doing a lot of research. Cool. So what, uh, what kind of research do you like to do, Chris? Well, uh, the, currently, this past week, I have been putting a lot of effort into a uh, article a colleague and I have been working on, on uh, sort of where the idea of scale models for the solar system comes from, where you Ooh. find, uh, yeah. you know, you go to planetariums and things like that. And, you know, you see the planets and the distances of the orbit laid out people that didn't just occur to everyone. There's actually an origin story to that. Ooh, cool. And that's what I've been working on most intently uh, that, and, uh, and then some work with, with, with uh, brother guy for, are, are two things that have been eaten up my time heavily recently. So Chris is very shy, so I will blow his horn a little bit. Whereas I'm an astro you know, an astronomer, a full-time professional astronomer, planetary scientist. Mm -hmm. Chris uh, is a retired community college teacher cool. who noticed that his students, though very bright, didn't have a whole lot of background in astronomy mm -hmm. and were asking exactly the same questions that people asked in the 17th century. And through a very long trail, became one of the leaders in the history of astronomy, especially cool. in 17th century astronomy. You've got a couple of books on the topic. Yes, and 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 the, the stuff about the solar system diagrams. These also go to 17th century astronomy. But yes, brother guy is right. I got into this from. I mean, I've been interested in astronomy as long as I can remember. You know, my mother would wake me up in the middle of the night to see eclipses of the moon, or we lived on the edge of a field, so she'd point out where the sun set at different times of the year. Nice. So I can't remember not being interested in astronomy. Cool. And I went and, you know, I, I studied physics and astronomy in college and graduate school, but then decided to go into teaching. And 
really did not think that I would be pursuing research much because I was going to community college teaching world. Um, we had an observatory, did a lot of outreach, you know, a lot of showing people the stars through telescopes, built a really cool refractor um, for that observatory. But I didn't really think that I would be doing research until my students just, they, you know, community college students, they don't know the questions you're not supposed to answer right. or ask, I should say. Right. You know, they, there are things that as astronomy enthusiasts, I have known my whole life. And they would ask stuff. I'm like, wow, you know, I've never thought about that. I just take that for granted. So, yes, brother guy is right. A lot of questions from students making me say, oh. I can't answer that. I'm going to have to go find it out. And then finding out that, you know, really people haven't looked into this at all. <laughs> Not much. So there, there's an awful lot of misconceptions out there. And yeah. when you do history of astronomy, you uncover them, including your own misconceptions. Yeah. And that really is kind of the origin of this article. Um, I did my thesis back at MIT in the 1970s, which was what, 10 or 20 years ago now, right? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> and I had written a thesis on the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and you know, came up with computer models that used punch cards and written in Fortran for yeah, an IBM yeah, yeah. 360 computer. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I had the first models that described how Europa would be covered with an icy crust and a thin ocean and a rocky core, a large rocky core. About 1995, which was only 30 years ago, I was approached by the people who were doing the University of Arizona Press book on Europa. Ooh. And they said, would you like to be part of the first chapter? And I think, finally, my work is being recognized. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to write up. The first chapter was the history chapter. Because even by 1995, everything that I had done was totally obsolete mm -hmm. and merely history. So we got the first draft of the chapter back. I described, you know, primitive things that we thought of the 1970s about the icy moons, about Europa. And then it was all the, the space missions after that. Oh, and there was a mention at the beginning that Galileo discovered them. And I thought, wait a minute, there's about 400 years of history that's missing. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, wait a minute. Among other things, I knew that Europa was a mixture of rock and ice because my professor had told me that. And that was so long ago, we didn't even have spectra in the infrared to show the, 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 oh, wow. you know, that, that there was wow. ice there. We just kind of knew. So I gave myself the challenge. Who was the first person to come up with this? Yeah. Eventually, it made a nice chunk of this chapter. And then in 2014, uh, the AAS, the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society, uh -huh. gave me the Carl Sagan Medal, uh, which is lovely because they misspelled my name on the medal. It was you know, a little bit of humility there. <laughs> and they said, you have to give a public talk. So I thought I'd give a public talk on, you know, how people discovered that the moons of Jupiter were made of ice. And then I ran into Chris and heard some of his stories of the history of astronomy. And we decided there is a whole history of things going wrong. And besides him knowing the 17th century, he had a whole lot more to add to the story that I didn't even know about. Very cool. So that's when we just said, this is a great story. I ran into Kelly Beatty at the Great Eclipse mm. of 2017. Mm -hmm. We were in the airport in uh, Memphis, I think. Okay. Because Chris and I had seen that eclipse together in, in a wonderful That's little right. town called Hopkinsville. So on the way home, I said to, to uh, Kelly, I've got this great story. He said, write it up, send it to Sky and Telescope. And five years later, we finally did. <laughs> uh, good time scale. Good time scale. That's an awesome story. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely Sky and Telescope article. Pioneering Science by Brother Guy and Chris on slipping on Jupiter's icy moons. And then we have three of them there. We got one, two, and three. Only EO missing there. Right. And so, Guy I'll, and I'll, I'll give you the, the little bit of the background. Um, and then Chris can jump in. But I think mostly what Chris is going to be able to do is branch out from this whole concept of what, why did I know? in 1971 
that Jupiter with Jupiter's moons were covered with ice. Okay. And there were, I thought, two things. Chris pointed out actually three things. The one thing I knew is that they had a high albedo. They're shiny. Ice yeah. is shiny. Mm -hmm. And they had a low density, mm -hmm. uh, relatively low density compared to rock. So that meant that there had to be something that was low density, like ice. So both of those said ice. Chris yeah. pointed out that there was an assumption I was making. The third thing that you had to know, Chris. Yeah, you got me at a loss. I'm having a brain freeze. Ah, that oh, was the third the, thing. The composition. Oh, right. Yes. The fact Sorry. that we knew <laughs> that, you know, we knew by 1971 that stars are made out of mostly hydrogen and that hydrogen and oxygen was going to be really common. But, you know, in the 19th century, did they know that? No, I'm thinking, terrible. I'm thinking, and, by and, the go ahead. Yeah, let me jump in here. And the interesting thing is, is that in the 19th century, people didn't tend to think of astronomy as being a thing where you cared about what stuff were ma was made of. You didn't, you didn't really, yeah. that just wasn't what astronomers did. They were looking at where things moved in the sky, not like what the stuff was made of. How would, you know, that, that, I don't know that anyway. <laughs> how would you know that anyway? You know, right. I, I think great... there's some, yeah, you're going to tell this, you're going to say this, go ahead, guy. No, there was a great philosopher, Comte, who wrote an article saying, there is a category of knowledge we will never have, namely yes. stuff like the composition of a star, because we can never sample a star, therefore it would be impossible to ever know, so we don't even think about those questions. That's right, that's oh. what I was about to say. Surprise. Right. <laughs> Well, because, you know, those other things, the albedo, surely they knew the albedo in the 19th century. And density, yes, well, to know density, you've got to know mass and you've not got to know radius. It turns out, yes. even in 1971, the best masses we had were probably from Laplace in 1805, wow. doing the analysis of how one moon pulled on another moon. Mm -hmm. Tied. And, and the radii were, you know, a couple of them we'd had occultations, but the other radii were still... Basically, basically, how big do they look in a telescope? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, somebody must have done this in the 19th century. You think? Here I am at the Vatican Observatory. We've got a big library. The library is full of textbooks from the 19th century. Cool. So let's go and see what textbook gives us the masses and the radii and the densities and then says, ah, these must be ice. Okay, good. And? None of them did this, <laughs> with one exception. But what's worse well, is okay. one of them, you know, everybody in the 19th century knew that the moons of Jupiter varied wildly in their brightness. And I think if you go to a, another uh, a picture further on, you might uh, see some of the people who are saying this. So uh, well, I can... Let me butt in there for a minute yeah. and, and ask yeah. and ask you to scroll back to that front the thing that has the diagram of Jupiter in it. Uh, go okay. back one more page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, that one. Um, the idea of Jupiter's moons varying in brightness had actually been discussed by this guy who you see the who who did this diagram. This was uh, Father Christoph Scheiner, mm -hmm. who is one of the guys that that Galileo liked to to get in fights with yeah. over, you know, Shiner is one of the people who claimed some, you know, uh, authority on sunspots. In fact, did a massive study of the sun um, that cool. uh, was sort of the, the benchmark uh, for solar science for a century. And, you know, you can see from this diagram that this person has paid attention to the moons of Jupiter and mm -hmm. has got all sorts of interesting things. He's got like how you might be able to work out the the Jovian distance by timing eclipses of the yes. moons and so on yes. and so forth. Yes. And he also says, talks about how the brightnesses of the moons and things in the system can be influenced by the presence of Jupiter. Um, so uh, Cause, cause I'll, I'll let Guy pick this up to the back to the 19th century here. Right. What had happened was uh, in the 19th century, people were measuring the brightness of the moons. How do you do that in the 19th century? With the eye. Human eye is a very good detector. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you look at the object and then you look at a standard star. Okay. Unfortunately, oh. when you're looking at the object and Jupiter is in the field of view, your pupil is going to shrink and, right. and the moon is going to look dimmer than it really is. Mm -hmm. If Jupiter's not in the field of view, the moon's going to look brighter. Yeah. 
And they saw that it was varying in brightness and they came up with fabulous theories about how maybe it was shaped like a pancake and tumbling. So sometimes you would see it face on and sometimes you would oh, see an edge on. That's cool. I didn't and if, that. if it was shaped like a pancake, maybe that's because it was spinning really fast and it was made mm. out of something soft. Wow, very cool. I didn't well, there is one guy, but, but the, the worst problem is that even taking average sizes and average masses, nobody asked the question, what's the density? Wow. Except for one popularizer named Chambers, okay. who took yeah. the real masses, they're not too far from what we knew by 1971, and the radii, which is not too far from what we knew in 1971, calculated a density from that, and the numbers he calculates are completely wrong. Okay. And they're not even consistently wrong. Just using his numbers, you don't get the numbers that he lists in his book. Um, you know, maybe he had some high school kid doing the, the, the division for him. Who knows? <laughs> but the, and, and they're totally well, and I, think, so, I think to the point, this is how, to, to it, you know, just like, it, it seems to go along with the idea of really not paying a lot of thought to what stuff in the heavens are made out of, you know, yeah. Oh, we, we calculated some numbers, but we don't actually think about it, yeah. that the numbers that, the, that they came up with are numbers that don't represent anything that you find in nature, you know, stuff in nature tends to be, you know, the, a lot more dense than water, you know, like lead or iron, you know, down to the density of water, a little bit less dense than water, like ice and some kinds of wood. But these were all down even lower in stuff that you just, you know, it's like st density of styrofoam or something. And, you <laughs> yeah, know, which they didn't have in the 19th aerogel. century. Aerogel. So, so yeah. when did they do this? What, when did the uh, 1860s. Change? 1860. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Finally, 1870, um, Pickering comes up with a new may of, way of measuring brightness. He's got uh, polarized filters, cross polars, cross nickels, mm -hmm. they called them. Mm -hmm. And he would put um, the moon and then have Jupiter with these cross nickels or a standard star and make the two of equal brightness. Okay. And then see how much he had to dim the, the brightness of Jupiter, the brightness of the star to make it. This. So this eliminated ah. the problem. Mm -hmm. And he announces with great fanfare, I've shown that the moons do not change in brightness. Okay. All right. 15, 20 years later, he finally puts together the best radii he has and the best densities, you know, the masses and the best densities. And he says, these guys are brighter than rock, which is true. true. And these guys are less dense than rock, which is true. And from this, we can conclude that they are made of piles of white sand. Oh, so close. <laughs> because if oh. you had a pile of white sand, you could explain why they were shaped like pancakes. Oh, you still had They only had to be shaped like pancakes to explain the brightness changes that he already showed didn't exist. There you go. Pickering. <laughs> uh, well, something else. It's something else. Chris, yeah. Quite a, quite an unusual little, little uh, turn of events there. Eventually, someone figures it out that uh, Harold Jeffries. Right. You know, but but the other piece that was needed was to know that water ice would be common. And so that spectra that you have there uh -huh. goes back to another great 19th century astronomer uh, whose picture is now coming up, Angelo Secchi. Mm -hmm. And he Secchi. built a telescope on the roof of the church that the Jesuits had built in Rome. Mm -hmm. The guy who built the church was Galileo's great rival. Um, 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 yep. Horatio Grassi. Horatio Grassi, right? thank you. Yeah. This is why yeah. we have two of us, because when one of us brain freezes, the other can come up. There you go. And he's the first guy to take spectra of stars, not just one or two, but like 5,000 of them, awesome. and classify them according to their spectra and mm -hmm. to recognize that some stars have carbon but most don't he doesn't quite he knows that there's hydrogen he doesn't and helium which of course had been found in the spectrum of the sun right yeah. but he doesn't yet have it quantified enough to say that the stars are mostly hydrogen and helium okay. so that's the 20th century and that's where jeffries in the 1920s comes in ah. if i can inject a couple more little bits about Secchi and his telescope on top of uh, St. Ignatius. Yeah, that's is the telescope. That, uh, 
Yeah, it is St. Ignatius was designed to have a big dome on top of it, which they didn't build. And so it had the structural support to hold a dome and no dome. So okay. Seki put an observatory up there because, you know, it, it could it could it could hold it. And they, they, they had tried to give him a, a tower in a nearby building. Oh, oh you want oh. to look at the stars? How about a high tower, which, of course, shakes <laughs> in the wind? You know, not a good thing for a telescope. Then the other thing is, is if you go to, you know, some sort of, you know, like uh, a Google Earth or some other thing that gives you a satellite view of Rome and look for the Church of St. Ignatius, okay. you can still see the the ring that was where the dome was originally going to be built. And then you can see smaller round things. And that's where Secchi's telescope domes were. Take, so take a look see. at this picture here. You see that there's yeah. um, a wooden structure with windows and a wooden dome. All yeah. of that wooden stuff is gone, but it's built on, you know, solid concrete, basically, which you can see in the picture there and which is still there. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to have to get on Google, uh, Google and check this out. Very nice. But the yeah. other problem that comes with this was Seki was also somebody who thought that he was seeing disks or strange things on the surface of the Can't ice. Can't get away from that. Can't get away from that. <laughs> <clears throat> That's right, and he makes drawings of it too, which we happened to, which we happen to find good copies of in the Vatican Observatory's library. And he even has uh, one drawing of one of Jupiter's moons that seems to show polar caps like it's, Mars. So uh, that, yeah, that that one with the nine circles up upper left corner, right there. Mm -hmm. That's it. You, you, yeah, you can see those little things that look like pole caps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's seeing uh, these other features which he claims are real. Now, you got to remember, Ganymede is the biggest moon of Jupiter, and it's maybe an arc second and a half across. Okay. And with Secchi's telescope, you've got, you know, the best possible resolution is about an arc second. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, you, know, across, you might work. have four pixels Brilliant. to work with. Yeah. But... Uh, as every, as every amateur astronomer knew, knows, one of the most useful tools is, along with averted vision, is averted imagination. <laughs> and, and he, he, he was thought, excellent at that. Yeah, he thought he was seeing something. And this is with uh, about a 10-inch telescope. It, yeah. If people want to see a telescope that's... I'm going to put a plug for my region in here. If you want to essentially see Secchi's telescope... Yeah. Go to the Cincinnati Observatory in Cincinnati, Ohio. Secchi okay. was using a Mertz refractor. They have one, an 11-inch or 10-inch Mertz refractor. Looks wow. exactly the same. Cool. It's fully operational. And so, uh, you know, get them to, you know, if you go, the, if you live somewhere where you can get to Cincinnati, go there and ask and and, and look at Jupiter and see if you can see uh, anything on the hey. on the surface of Ganymede with that thing. Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, we'll put a we'll put a link to the uh, telescope there in the description below the video to that telescope. Cool. All uh, right. But, you know, part of part of the history of uh, Secchi, of course, is he's tied up in the politics of the 19th century because mm -hmm. this is when Italy is being unified. Nice. And in 1870, Garibaldi's armies march into Rome. The Pope flees to the Vatican. Secchi, yeah. of course, is out in the middle of the town, and his observatory is confiscated. But he is so famous throughout Europe that they allow him to continue to use the telescope until his death. <laughs> At that point, the Italians uh, confiscate all the instruments, move it to a different location. Oh, okay. By the 1930s, his telescope was used as a finder scope for a bigger telescope. Okay. And it was destroyed in a fire in the 1950s, which is very sad. Dang. Rats. So, um, when do people get the idea that these are not pancakes? It must really occur someplace between the 1890s when Pickering published his article mm -hmm. and the 1920s when uh, Jeffries wrote his and okay. just assumed that they were spherical. But this is also, this branches off then to the whole strange history of planetary science because Secchi did one more thing, which is somewhat infamous. Okay. He was not trained as an astronomer, so he didn't care that real astronomers don't measure spectra. 
And he looked at the surface of Mars and the other planets. He took a spectra of, of Uranus and actually found uh, carbon, traces of carbon Ooh. in the atmosphere yeah. of methane. Cool. When he looked at Mars, he looks at the surface and tries to figure out what are those markings. One of the very first people to do this. Sure. And, you know, he, he publishes in the 1840s and the 1850s some of these drawings that he has. Yeah, yeah. Well, in his articles, he refers to dark regions appearing like channels between brighter regions. Mm -hmm. The things he's talking about are real. They're, they're you know, the albedo uh, features that you can see to this day. Mm -hmm. yep. But he uses the Italian word canali for channel. Mm -hmm. A generation after him, another Italian who was one of these guys who got things almost right by spades, Schiaparelli. Ah, yes. And Schiaparelli thinks he's seeing thin lines connecting the bright regions. And those become his canali, which then Percival Lowell turns into canals and people on Mars. And, and we had civilizations and, you know, terraforming across right. the entire globe. <laughs> what this does to the history of astronomy, this is well beyond where the, uh, the, the article goes. If you go to, NASA has this big website, ADS, where they have abstracts of every article that's ever been published in astronomy that they can find going mm -hmm. back to the 19th century. Yes. So you count the number of articles per year or per decade with okay. the word star in the abstract. That's sort of okay. a standard. If, if there's more astronomy happening, there'll be more articles with the word star in the abstract. Yeah. And then you use that to divide into the number of articles that has the word Mars in the abstract. Okay. Mars is really popular into the 1905s when Percival Lowell starts pushing this idea of creatures on Mars and he kills the field. Because uh -huh. no respectable uh -huh. astronomer uh -huh. wants to write about Mars when they're everyone's thinking they're going to be talking about UFOs and, right, and, right. and the the aliens, of course. <laughs> so this ratio oh, collapses to nothing. Uh -huh. And essentially no planetary science happens from about 1920 yeah. until 1958, 59, Sputnik yeah. and then NASA comes back. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So when Jeffries writes this article about the moons of Jupiter, nobody references it. Nobody's interested in studying planets. And he himself isn't an astronomer. He's a geophysicist. What do they know? Heaven forbid that they should come into the field. Oh, if these are things not properly of astronomical interest. Ah, uh, awesome. That is great. I did not know that. Very and so, Chris, that, that's a phrase that you picked up on and, and begin to see over and over again. Yeah, stuff that, you know, we, we, you know, astronomers are humans, you know, we, we get hung up on our own ideas of, of what we want. I mean, we've just touched on several of these aside from, you Absolutely. know, the, the stuff about the composition. We just talked about um, both gaining interest in Mars and losing interest in Mars based on sort of what people find of interest and not of interest. One of the things about astronomy is it's really not the study of stars and planets and galaxies. It's the study of what human beings think about stars and planets and galaxies. Yes. And if the conversation isn't about Mars and you've got something cool to say about Mars, people are going to look at you like, yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. You know, go away, kid. <laughs> and rightly so, because if you don't have someone to have the conversation with, then you're just talking to yourself. And that's not science. Very good. Very good. That is correct. Uh, that is an awesome little stat there on ADS. I love that. Very cool. Very cool. I've learned a whole lot <laughs> that I didn't. I, that I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> so this has been very, very good. I really enjoyed this one. Well, this is one of the great things of now I'm collaborating with a historian because yeah. he's found all sorts of fascinating things of what was going on in the 18th or 17th and 18th century about astronomy. Um, essentially, everything you know <clears throat> about the debate over the heliocentric system is wrong. You know, Galileo didn't have the goods. The best astronomy of the day proved he was wrong. Well, guess what? The best astronomy of the day was wrong. Right. And this, if nothing else, should teach us a little bit of humility. Humility, indeed. Definitely. Chris, are you a member of the uh, uh, historical? Division of the 
Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Just we got to do something you know. about that. Yeah, <laughs> you got an enormous amount of am ammo here. So very cool. Yeah. He's had a couple of books um, published by Notre Dame Press and Academic and a number of articles in the Journal of the History of Astronomy. So. Okay, we'll put some uh, we'll put some links to those as well yeah. uh, in the description below the video. So and and actually, you wind up getting published uh, or at least referenced in Physics Today a bit, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I've had a couple of things in Physics Today, including more about these things that we think that we know. One of the most entertaining is. Um, in those early discussions about the heliocentric theory, it turns out that people came up with essentially the, an idea of the Coriolis effect. Mm -hmm. There's like, look, if the earth is rotating, these are people who said the earth is not rotating. They said, look, if the earth is rotating, then the ground to the north has to be moving slower than the ground to the south. So if you fired cannons to the north, you should be able to see them deflect. To the right. And they also had, at the time, it was very common for people to have very high opinions of the ability of cannoneers to drop cannonballs onto a, a hair at you know precision 500 yards. guided precision yeah. guided. <laughs> right so guy and i got into a discussion the thing that came up in physics today because it's a spin-off of this is that guy and i were having a talk and and he and we were referring to the story about the coriolis effect affecting um the trajectory of artillery in the first world war and guy was saying which i had referred to especially I, I referred the, to it in the book right. Yeah, men mentioned the, that naval battle, especially. The battle of the Falkland Islands down okay. in uh, the South America, so, so off the coast of South America. Uh -huh. And Guy had said, well, that, that's not going to do anything because the pit, ship's pitching around too much. Well, I'd read this in what I considered to be reliable sources, and I had referred to it in one of my books. I was like, oh, brother. So I'm looking to see if Guy's right. And I go back and find original you know, articles from the time. Cool about the Falklands battle. And no, they don't mention anything. They mention nothing about it. Not only that, but the whole story is that like this was the first time the British had ever fought, you know, in the Southern hemisphere. And so they didn't account for the effect to be in the other direction. No, yeah. the British yeah. had had a battle like a month earlier. And, you know, and so right. it, it's these stories that we have, you know, you can find that Falklands story in one physics textbook after another. You, you know, just all kinds of very reputable physics oh, textbooks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, that have been used over decades. And, and it's so wrong. it propagates. It's right. wrong. It propagates. It's wrong. And this is the way a lot of our stories in science turn out to be, you know, and it's yeah. it's fun. It's but it's also humbling. It's, you know, they're great stories, but they're, they're humbling. Mm -hmm. It's also sort of humbling, you know, to think that the Coriolis effect was devised 200 years before Coriolis to prove that the earth wasn't spinning. Because since you couldn't see cannonballs, you know, always going off to the right, right. therefore the earth is not spinning. Therefore, you know, Copernicus must be wrong. Right. Fabulous science with the wrong result. Yeah. Still too small. <laughs> you can find di you can find diagrams in books written in the 1600s that you could just pull out and use as a Coriolis effect discussion even now. Wow, wow! They and got the physics it, right. It, yeah, and to turn that around, you know, a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I don't think in in you know 2022 that we've gotten away from some of our ability to tell stories that we believe um, going forward. And so it will be to the astronomers 100 years, 200 years from now, they'll go, ho, 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 how did they ever believe that? <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know, there, there are certain things that everybody knows are true. And yet one of the things that I, I was, as a planetary scientist, I was shocked to hear, maybe someone can correct me, but there was a time when, uh, you know, everybody talks about how supernovas work. And mm -hmm. supernovas are a really essential part of our cosmology, our formation of elements. But the physics behind supernovas is still not understood. Yes. We know they're there. They're there. But See. We can kind of wave our hands about how they ought to work. But so far, the numbers don't add up. Neutrinos or, they come out, they stall, they go, and then you only need 1%. And oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or to stick with the planetary example and to stick with what's been in Sky and Telescope. I mean, rather recently, there has been a substantial article in Sky and Telescope about all of the planets that we have found orbiting other stars whose sizes range between Earth, Venus, and Uranus, Neptune, which, you know, at one time it was like, well, you know, they're, they, they, 
planets come in two sizes, little rocky planets like, you know, Mercury, <laughs> Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then That's big right. things like Jupiter, Saturn, etc. And now we find it, you know, and not only that, I, I can explain to you why it had to be that way, why these planets in the in-between size are impossible by okay. this very handy theory. Okay. Which is wrong. What is this handy theory? <laughs> oh, because if they got to be too big, they would collapse the solar nebula onto them and immediately jump from rocky size to gas giant size. Ah, I got it, I got it, I got it. So you have a bifurcation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, yeah. as Chris points out. Ah, uh, you yeah, we were wrong. We were wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Astronomy would be so much easier if we didn't have that data getting in the way. Yeah, we weren't wrong so often. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so let me ask, where, where do we go from here, given given the published article? Are, are uh, we going to uncover more, more mysteries about um, the historical aspects of Jupiter's moons, and we'll do a, a version two or new data? So where do you think we go with this? Well, Chris and I have been working on a book, which cool. takes us in an interesting new direction, because the other thing we've all endured the last couple of years has been COVID and the science denialism of a lot of people mm -hmm. and the science mistrust. Yes, Astronomy is you know one of the few places where everybody seems to still be able to look at the same sky and talk to each other. And oh, that's well, nice. We don't want to miss nice. that. But we realized that science's fan club can be its worst enemy okay and the people who keep saying you know follow the science trust the science because science will give us the truth science is the best way we have to handle these things you know science vaccines are better than no vaccines mm -hmm. but if you hold up scientists as being you know the priesthood of truth Mm. Yeah, I'm in the, in the business and, and working for yeah, yeah, you are. And boy, <laughs> you know, we're not in great repute nowadays. <laughs> um, every time that science gets it wrong, it's used as a check mark against science why we shouldn't trust it. Right, which neglects the point of the scientific process. Which is ex exactly how you do this. <laughs> and the, the fact that in that science can go wrong, and not only can it go wrong, but it goes wrong. In, in ways, it's not just always, well, someone's being stupid. You know, very often it goes wrong. Those people who thought of the Coriolis effect, they were being pretty smart. Yeah. You know, they were on the right track. And so we've, we've collected various stories that Pickering and the moons, right? They're not dumb people. They oh. were just putting the wrong ideas together. And mm -hmm. so very often science goes wrong while it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's not some breakdown of science, it's just the nature of science. And in fact, science progresses when it goes wrong. By errors, that's exactly By errors. how you move forward. Is, oh, that doesn't yeah. fit, that doesn't work. You know, it, it's the old engineering slogan, you know, failure is not an option and science, say, failure is not an option, it's a requirement. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> exactly. Like, but that's not, how, that's not how a lot of people are taught science. You yeah, know, exactly, and, and, that's the and, trouble. Going right. back to like some of the questions my students would ask, they had this view that science was like this golden book yeah. of truth that you flipped open. And then if it, well, then if they have a question about like, how do you know that or blah, 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 then that showed that, you know, there was some sort of nefarious side to all this. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and that's where I think Chris's, uh, you know, background is so powerful because we have no trouble convincing the MIT graduates, except some engineers I know. <laughs> but, Fair enough. <laughs> but these are the people who need to be convinced. It's it's the guys who are doing community college in Kentucky who are really you know, the backbone of the country. And mm -hmm. we need to know how to talk to them. Exactly. Exactly. And get the process across. Mm -hmm. yeah. That it's okay to be wrong. Yes. As long as you're willing to admit you're wrong. Oh, well. And then ask, yeah. okay, where did I go wrong and how can I get better? Because mm -hmm. right. the, the point isn't to be perfect. The point is to be better. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, successful theory is one that goes obsolete. I go, I go back to my icy moons from my thesis, you know, 50 odd years ago. The fact that it was obsolete by 1995 is something I can be proud of because it meant okay. I was in a field that was so interesting that people kept studying it. That it was moving along right? yeah. it hadn't stagnated. No, oh, okay. Very nice. Well, we've got all kinds of wild new missions coming up, uh, lots of NASA stuff coming up. And so this is going to add to the story of 
of you know what is the composition of Europa both at the surface and below the surface and yep. what kind of rocks does it have and yeah so the the uh, progress in planetary science particularly the outer ones continues I'm I'm really excited um wow. one of the stories I tell in the sky and telescope article is the the time that I got it almost right cuz I wrote this thesis about the icy moons and I saw there was going to be water and rock and they were going to be intimately mixed mm -hmm. and at the very end of like the last paragraph, I say, you know, there could be organic chemistry happening here. There could be water in methane ice. There could be oh, water in wild ice. speculation. Do you do, brother guy? But <laughs> but because you know, I'd, I'd been a science fiction fan. This is you know how I got into science in the first place. Yeah. I'm dreaming of intelligent tunas swimming you know through the oceans of Europa. But then, I say in my thesis, I will stop short. Of postulating life in the oceans of Europa, <laughs> oh, and let other oh, people do that. <laughs> because I was in a culture where talking about life on planets, Carl Sagan did that. Heaven forbid you don't want to be like Carl Sagan, no, no. not properly of astronomical interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how cautious of you! How cautious! Right. Well, <laughs> cautious. How, how how obnoxious mostly. <laughs> But I would love to be able to see, you know, are there organic chemicals? Is there life in those oceans? Well, we in, may know here in 10, 20 years. Yes. Yeah. So I never thought I'd be, you know, around long enough to see as much as we've learned about oh. these planets. I never thought I would be able to confirm that there was water coming out of Enceladus. You know, and, nice. and even though I was, you know, one of the people involved in trying to see, well, does the magnetic field of Jupiter being deflected by Europa, does that, it's not inconsistent with liquid water. Yeah. But yeah. I grew up in a field where the best you could do was not inconsistent with. And now we're getting data. Busting those old myths. Right. Or in some cases, confirming those old myths. Right. Um, it's all good. Very cool. Brother Guy? Chris, I want to thank you so much for chatting about your very lovely Sky and Telescope article and many other things today. So thank you so much. We've had a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Thank you. All righty. And that will do, everyone. And I hope this may... Oh, and there's Chris. Hey, he makes <laughs> yeah. an appearance. Well, since, <laughs> since, it, since we're at the end, I thought I would risk turning on the camera and crashing my connection. So. <laughs> All right. We get one. I love where you're yeah. sitting. Very cool. Yeah, I see the leaves turning on those trees. There, there are some yellows and oranges in there. Oh, oh yeah. There's gorgeous colors everywhere. Very cool. Very nice. Well, thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>